Hello and welcome to lecture 11, part 1. Today we're going to chat about random walks and uh, their relationship to diffusion. In fact, this will be our class objective, to understand random walks and how they relate to diffusion. You might hear in the background that uh, there is uh, a helicopter whirring. That's not a helicopter. That's the previous lecture has been encoded in 4K resolution, which will hopefully be the destiny of the lecture that I am currently uh, recording over here for you guys. Uh, this is the last lecture. I am super excited to have taught this course. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit uh, nostalgic uh, because I'm not going to get to produce any more of these lectures um, for a while. I hope you've had a lot of fun and I wanted to ask you uh, for a favor uh, that you would come uh, online and uh, leave feedback uh, through CTAX. This is really important for the university uh, to know how well we're doing and teaching you. Um, this is really important for me to know how, how I am doing at teaching you people and uh, I would like to improve, so please uh, leave your feedback. I really, really appreciate your responses. Uh, now, uh, with that public service announcements, I am ready to get to the science. And the science today is exciting. Uh, we're going to be talking about random walk and diffusion. And there are so many excellent examples of random walks and diffusion. Uh, well, suppose you wake up in the morning. What is the first thing that you do? Well, I try to pour coffee. Uh, I like to use mocha. I don't know if you've tried it. If you haven't tried it before and you like strong coffee, then check it out. Uh, it maintains the flavor so well, better than the uh, actual espresso machine. So now that you've got your mocha and you poured it in this really, really nice cup and you hold it with your both hands, uh, it's still too hot. So what I do is I add some milk. And if you, if you add a drop of milk on top of your coffee, the milk uh, will be slowly spreading. That is a process of random walk where the molecules of milk are bouncing around and slowly diffusing away uh, from the droplet. So this is an example of diffusion. So if you were to look top down into our uh, coffee cup, that's the handle, I guess. Uh, and uh, if there was a drop of milk, uh, let's see, uh, I guess the only colors I have for the milk is blue. So if we have a droplet of, of milk, uh, then uh, the particles from the milk will be diffusing out randomly and slowly the droplet will be spreading. Uh, we can also uh, view this not in terms of the particles, This was the particle view. We can also um, view it uh, from the point of view of continuum approach. If we were to take a slice uh, through it, And uh, we were to start with uh, uh, a droplet like that. Then over time, it would spread more and more. So in both of these cases, what we're seeing is diffusion away from the origin. Um, and in one case, we're looking at it from the point of view of individual particles, which are making their way out. And in this case, we're uh, looking at it from the point of view of um, continuum description. Uh, we're describing the fluid, the milk, as a whole and how it is slowly making its way out from where it originated. There are many other examples of diffusion processes. For instance, perfume 
uh, diffuses through the air. So even if there is no wind, there is no draft, if you open a bottle of perfume, it will slowly fill the entire room. That is diffusion. What else is there? Uh, well, drunk people. Uh, every Friday, people start walking around. In fact, uh, there will be St. Patrick's Day very soon. So, uh, drunk people, they typically um, take steps in random direction. And so, that is uh, an example of uh, a uh, random walk, uh, random directions, uh, and random number of steps. Uh, in New York City, all the streets are flooded with business people that collide and go around each other, and so they are kind of diffusing through. So that is another example. And uh, uh, of course, there are more physical examples, uh, such as heat conduction. Uh, so uh, here is an example of how we can uh, um, think of it in a physical system. So, for instance, uh, we have uh, a heat source. Uh, over here, so the heat is coming in to the side of a chamber. And uh, there is a distance R that we can count off from zero where the heat source is located. And uh, we can try and measure how the heat is slowly spreading through uh, out our chamber. And if we plot the typical radius uh, where the heat managed to get to, or the perfume, or the drunk people, business people, uh, then we will find that uh, the dependence is looking something like that. This is not uh, a linear function. This is not um, r proportional to t. This actually is a slower dependence r proportional to square root of t. So the heat is not going to be flying with a constant speed like we saw with waves. Here, the heat will be slowly seeping through with a kind of velocity that seems to be slowing down, right? The slope of this is, is becoming flatter and flatter. Uh, so this is a movement, movement with constant velocity. And that is not what we have in uh, heat conduction. So, uh, just to be clear, R here is the distance Uh, where heat travels. So how far the heat has gone. And uh, T is the time. In fact, if we make it more quantitative, uh, then what we will have uh, is a proportionality factor over here. And so the expression will look like the distance that the heat traveled is equal to square root of k, which is a constant for simplicity, times the time. And k is uh, the heat conductivity. So the, the higher is the heat conductivity um, of our chamber, the faster 
the heat will get to a distance r. So let's consider a very simple example of a diffusive process, which is the random walk. And we will see why it is a diffusive process. So in this case, uh, we will just make a really simple one-dimensional model. So that will be our x-coordinate. Uh, we will start at 0. And our walker, or you can call it an absolutely drunk person, uh, will be making absolutely random steps. A uh, walker has to take a step every time. Uh, and uh, uh, they can either step forward or backward. Forward or backward. And so these are the positions that the walker can get to. And uh, at any position, the probability uh, of taking a step forward is equal to the probability of taking the step back. So it's always 50-50. So this absolutely drunk person um, always throws up a coin in the air and figures it out, uh, whether it's head or tails, and heads or tails. And therefore, it either uh, the person either takes the step forward or the step back. So the question is, how far can one get uh, when undergoing such a random walk? Well, let's try and estimate it. And what we're going to try and get at here is something that perhaps looks like this, like a square root uh, dependence. And we, in fact, will see where it's coming from in this really, really simple system. And that is the connection uh, to diffusion. So uh, let's uh, uh, ask, what will be uh, the average value of x after n steps? Well, because uh, left and right steps are um, equally probable, the mean value of x at the nth step, or xn, is 0. However, something is increasing, and uh, that is the mean of x n squared. And that is going to go up. Let us try and uh, uh, confirm um, or refute this intuition. So let us uh, compute what xn is. Well, xn is uh, the position uh, to which we got through taking n steps. So we're going to sum up over the steps from the first one up to the nth one. And uh, every step as i uh, will be either plus 1 or minus 1 with equal probability. So from here, we will immediately see that indeed the average of xn uh, is the sum uh, from i equals 1 to n of the average of si. And the average of every si is 0 because step forward and step backward, or step right, step left, are equally probable. So an average SI is 0. And therefore, we are going to get 0 uh, for the expectation value of Xn. OK, that is really cool. Now, we have shown that this is indeed the case. Uh, so what about this other one? 
what about the average of x n squared? So let me give myself a little bit more room. This is a little bit more involved. So let's compute this. So x n squared is equal to the uh, average is equal to the average of x n time x n. So let's write x n as the sum of s i and uh, the other x n as the sum of s j. And uh, now we have two sums. So what we can do is we can uh, take out the sum signs um, and uh, we'll get the product, um, pairwise product between SIs and SJs as typically, as usual when we have two um, expressions in parentheses. Well, what do we do? Uh, we multiply them pairwise and that's precisely what we have done here. So now what else we can do? We can take out the summation uh, from underneath the average because the two commute. It doesn't matter whether I average the sum or whether I sum the individual pieces. That's because this is a simple addition. It's a linear operation. So it commutes uh, with the average, with these angle brackets, which denote the average. So what we're going to get is the sum over i and j going from 1 up to n. For simplicity, I united both of these for compactness of notation into one single expression. And what we have here is uh, the product of si times sj. So what is this product equal to? Well, um, si is j. If i is not equal to j, um, because the two steps are completely independent from each other, uh, we're going to get a zero as a result. And uh, if i is equal to j, then it will be si squared. And si is either minus 1 or 1. And square is always 1. So we are going to get a 1. So that means that uh, in the sum, the only terms that survive are where i is equal to j. And so we're going to have n of such diagonal terms. All the of diagonal terms are going to go away. And so what we're getting as a result is uh, n times 1. So we're going to get n. And so from here, we conclude that the average of xn squared is equal to n. After n steps, we're going to be on average um, uh, the typical value of xn is going to be the square root of the average of xn squared, and that is square root of n. So a typical uh, displacement from the origin is going to go as the square root of the number of steps, of the square root of the number of random steps taken. And that is very, very similar to what we found previously. And because we uh, can think of one step taken uh, per unit time, all the steps uh, take the same amount of time. Uh, we have obtained something that looks very, very similar uh, to the diffusion in time. Uh, the typical distance is square root of uh, the time or the number of steps that has been taken. 
So we can write that this goes as square root of t. So if we were to plot xn squared versus n, what we would find is something like that. So this scaling would go as xn squared proportional to n, or if we take uh, equal number of steps per unit time, let's say one step a second, uh, then our displacement uh, squared uh, will tend to scale uh, proportional to time. That's it for our random walk and diffusion part of our lecture. And I'm going to see you in part two of lecture 11, where we're going to be talking about a more direct connection of random walks and diffusion. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to see you in the next part. One, two, three. Hello and welcome to part two of our lecture 11, where we actually are going to make a more direct connection between a random walk and a diffusive process. Here is how we're going to do it. So suppose that we have a one-dimensional system and uh, we would like to understand how molecules would move along this uh, system. So that's our x-coordinate. And we're going to break it down into bins. Um, you know, bin, um, bin 0, uh, bin 1, bin minus 1. Uh, so you can imagine that every bin contains a bunch of molecules and these molecules can hop either to the right or to the left. And the same thing happens with other bins. So every bin loses some molecules because um, just probabilistically um, the molecules move in between the bins and uh, uh, sometimes it gains the molecule. So it can lose a molecule either to the left or to the right, or it can gain a molecule either from the left or from the right. So suppose that we would like to quantify this. So let us imagine that each of these contains a certain number of molecules. This one contains N0, and this one contains and one, and that one contains and minus one. So uh, here is our x coordinate. Um, so how do we quantify the change in the content of our bin zero? Well, it's the number of these guys that jump over here. Um, plus the number of those that jump over here, minus the ones that jump out.
So the way we can uh, uh, formalize it is through an equation. So let's write down uh, the number of molecules in this bin zero at the new time. So t is the current time and new time will be delta t uh, later. Um, minus the current number of molecules within that box. So n0 at t plus delta t minus n0 of t in the future minus currently. Uh, and that will be equal to the number of molecules that hopped into n0 from n minus 1. So that will be the probability for that hopping to the right uh, times the number of molecules in that bin. Right, so P is the probability to jump. Uh, similarly, uh, we need to add the number of molecules that would jump from the bin to the right uh, to the zeroth bin, which would look very similar. Um, but then we would need to subtract uh, both the molecules that jump to the left and jump to the right. And uh, again, the probability of jumping to one side is always p. But here we have two sides uh, that we're going to be losing the molecules. So it's going to be two sides times p uh, times n0. So that is our equation that's telling us how our molecules are going to be evolving. And P here uh, is probability per unit time. Okay, so if we wait for twice as long, the probability will become twice as high. So that's why there is a delta T over here and there is a P over there. Uh, the two are related to each other. Uh, so now let us try and uh, uh, simplify this. So what we can do is we can uh, um, switch from the index to the actual continuum, uh, continuous x coordinate. Uh, so we will be able to write that n of uh, t plus delta t uh, comma x minus n at t comma x is going to be equal to the probability, this p, that we will uh, factor out. And that multiplies n minus 1. So that will be n at um, a t x minus delta x, right? It's uh, shifted by 1 to delta x to the left plus n of t at x plus delta x, right? Plus 1 to the right. And there will be minus 2 n at t x. Uh, that's because we subtracted off uh, minus 2 times the content of the current uh, bit. So now this looks uh, like something that we have seen before. Uh, first of all, we can rewrite this as dn dt times delta t, right? And uh, this looks suspiciously similar to an expression for a second derivative with respect to x. So what we can write down is that um, if we were to divide this by delta x squared and multiply this by delta x squared, we would get p times delta x squared multiplied by the second derivative. So that will be d2n dx squared. And on the left-hand side, as we already established, uh, we have dn dt times delta t. And so what we get from here 
is uh, our um, diffusion equation. dn dt is equal to, we're going to collect all the dt's together, p times delta x squared divided by delta t uh, times d2n dt squared. And uh, this thing over here, this thing over here is called uh, the diffusion coefficient. So let's uh, recap what we just got here. It's remarkable. Starting from a purely probabilistic random walk approach, uh, we have a probability of jumping forward or backwards or right or left, uh, which was a constant per unit time. We have been able to go to continuum description, obtain a continuum description of diffusive process, this random walk process, which is diffusion because we've gotten a diffusion equation that describes it um, that is parameterized by the diffusion coefficient. There are a few points that I would like to note here and we will do so in part 3 of our awesome lecture 11 where I'm going to see you in just a couple of seconds. Bye! Hello and welcome to part 3 of our lecture 11 where are we going to go over a few important notes about what we've just uncovered. And what we've uncovered is a big deal. We were able to derive a diffusion equation uh, for a system that was described by random walk. So we have established that random walk and diffusion are two tightly coupled physical processes. Random walk uh, looks at uh, the process of diffusion from the microscopic uh, point of view. Whereas diffusion looks at it uh, from the point of view of continuum approximation. Uh, the two are one and the same uh, process, just viewed from different perspectives. So here are the promised notes. Number one, as we mentioned before, the probability that we introduced over here, probability p, is probability uh, per unit time. So P, or rather p divided by delta t will be the probability of unit time. Um, so that is what we get. Okay, so that's number one. And uh, number two is that under our assumption, this probability per unit time for a molecule to hop from one bin to the other is a constant, doesn't change in time. This corresponds to essentially a constant diffusion coefficient that we introduced over there. Now number two is that uh, the typical um, value of x out to which our quantity manages to diffuse out to or the molecules manage to diffuse out to can be read up directly from the equation. So let's try and, and see how we can find delta x uh, proportionality to square root of t, the typical delta x. Um, we can indeed read it off directly from the equation. And the equation uh, looks like dn dt is equal to the diffusion coefficient times dn d2n dt squared. And so if we replace dn dt with simply n over t, 
and uh, replace the partial derivative um, as d, the diffusion coefficient, times n, divided by the x squared. So we can immediately, or rather we can put in this typical distance out to which we go, uh, we can immediately from here obtain that typical delta x will be uh, roughly, so the n goes away, uh, square root of d uh, times t. So we can see uh, the basic property of the random walk directly from our diffusion equation, underlining the tight relationship between the two. Well, we just came in from discussing a wave equation in the previous lecture. How are the two related to each other? Well, we can write down the wave equation, and let me change the color just uh, for it to be more fun. Well, uh, the wave equation looks different. It has a second time derivative and uh, uh, and uh, the diffusion equation has the first time derivative. So this is a key crucial difference. Just one extra derivative makes a world of difference. So for this equation, if we have uh, a blob, this blob will be, or rather even a, a wave, this wave will propagate in time. Whereas, as we'll see in just a second, In the case of diffusion equation, our blob will not be propagating anywhere. What will happen is that if we start with a blob, it will spread out. Or if we start with another blob, we're going to basically end up getting the same solution. So here, what we discover is that the solutions to diffusion equation are convergent. That is, for rather different initial conditions, we're going to end up with something that looks extremely, extremely similar. And the, the kind of general um, shape of our blob into which everything will morph uh, will look like this. N uh, is some factor C times this blob, which is a Gaussian. Uh, with the dispersion that's time dependent, so sigma is the dispersion, and sigma here tells us uh, the, the distance out to which our blob will have spread. And so here, sigma is equal to square root of two times the diffusion coefficient uh, times the time. And as a recap, here in the diffusion equation, we get essentially the same result for different initial conditions. Not the same story uh, in the wave equation. Completely different behavior. Here we have waves, here we have spreading. So how do we actually come around and solve uh, this on a computer? And that's what we're going to be talking about in part four of our lecture 11. Uh, this is super exciting, and there are some problems in the last assignment of this quarter, of this course, uh, that involve numerically solving both the random walk 
and the diffusion equations. So let's take a look at how to solve the diffusion equations. I'm going to see you in part four in just a moment. Hello and welcome to part four of lecture 11. We are going to talk about solving the diffusion equation on a computer numerically. So let's write down our numerical scheme. So as uh, previously, we need to come up with a stencil on which we're going to evaluate the derivatives that appear in our diffusion equation. So it has the first derivative in time, and so we would only need to, to have two cells in order to difference the values from each other. So our stencil could look like something like that. So uh, here we will have the point in the future. Uh, this is the current point i. This is i minus 1. This is i plus 1. And uh, this will be uh, point i but at n plus 1 time step. So this will be i n, i minus 1 n, i plus 1 n, and this will be i n plus 1. So that would be our stencil. So here we're going to evaluate the time derivative. So it will be n at t plus delta t x. So that will be this point minus n of t x. That will be that point all divided by delta t. So that's an approximation of the time derivative. And uh, all of that is going to be equal to our diffusion coefficient. In fact, um, we can immediately divide it by delta x squared. Uh, and we're going to multiply it by the numerical representation of a second derivative in space. So what will that be? Well, we've already seen that before. So it will be n of uh, time goes first in my notation. So I just try to be consistent. So it will be a time x plus delta x minus, so that will be this value, minus, um, actually plus, uh, x minus delta x and then there will be minus uh, 2n t x. So that is all that we need to write down for a numerical scheme and uh, just for short we can uh, represent this using the two index notation as before. So it will be n of i n plus 1 minus n of i n divided by delta t is going to be equal to d divided by delta x squared multiplied by n of i plus 1 um, n plus n of i minus 1 n minus 2 n i n. So that, this and that are two equivalent representations, it's just this one is using a more compact notation. Uh, as before, uh, this index is uh, denoting the spatial position and that index is denoting the temporal or the time uh, position. So n goes up and i goes uh, to the right. So now let us um, express the value that we would like to find in terms of the rest explicitly. And uh, the way we're going to do that is 
simply by multiplying both sides by delta t and adding uh, nin uh, to both sides. So we're going to end up getting nin plus 1 is going to be equal to d times delta t divided by delta x squared uh, times all of this and i plus 1 and plus and i minus 1 and minus 2 i n plus and i n so that is all there is to our numerical uh, scheme We're done and can declare victory. You can code this up on your computer and run it. But not so fast, not quite yet, because we need to decide, as before for the wave equation, what are the initial conditions, uh, what are the boundary conditions, and what sort of uh, values can we choose for delta x and delta t, which ones would be reasonable. So let's try and address that in item 6, which I'm going to draw in a different color uh, for uh, variety. So let's discuss the initial conditions, boundary conditions, um, and the choice of delta x and delta t. So as we discussed, uh, the results are insensitive to the initial conditions. However, we need to choose something, and uh, that depends on the problem. So if you would like to see how heat pulse diffuses, well, you start with a tight Gaussian, and you see how it diffuses. Just make sure that there are at least a few cells that resolve, as we say, the Gaussian, that are contained within the Gaussian, so that the initial distribution uh, is well represented on the grid. Otherwise, if you push everything into one single cell, well, maybe the numerical scheme won't be happy about it. It's uh, used to having things be smooth on the numerical grid. So what about the uh, boundary conditions? So we have uh, gotten done with the initial conditions. Uh, let's uh, see what about the boundary conditions. Well, in the case of the diffusion equation, let's just take away all the boundary conditions altogether. Let's move them far away uh, so they don't matter. So take far away uh, set n to 0. So uh, the guard cells or the uh, boundary cells, you can just set them to 0. Uh, all the action is happening far away from the boundaries, uh, near the boundaries, everything will be 0. And if it's not 0, if something is approaching the boundaries, well, move the boundaries further away so they do not really affect the solution on the inside. So that's the approach that we're going to take. So we have addressed the boundary condition question, and there are only two remaining, delta x and delta t. The spatial time step, sorry, the spatial step and the temporal step, space and time step. So uh, for delta x, uh, the reasoning is pretty clear. If we have a really small sharp peak, sorry, really sharp uh, narrow peak that is diffusing, well, you need to choose the cells to be small enough such that a few of them fit within this length scale uh, that is uh, characterizing uh, the initial distribution of the energy on the grid. So delta x needs to be chosen to be much smaller than the characteristic wavelength of the problem. And that is our answer for the spatial step. Of course, as before, when we dealt with ODEs, it's always a good idea to run the problem with double spatial resolution and see if the answer uh, converges so that if you keep increasing the resolution, that your algorithm 
approaches the high resolution or the analytic solution accurately. So if you have an analytic solution for uh, the diffusion of initially Gaussian profile, like we discussed, well, code it up and make sure that the numerical algorithm actually is able to reproduce that. That will be a test of how well uh, the numerical scheme that you coded up actually works. And finally, uh, the, uh, the big deal is the time step. What should it be? Well, let's consider a general problem, a general, um, let's say, OD, forget about the PD. Suppose that we are uh, considering a problem where the left-hand side is given by some function of the dependent variable A. How would we integrate that? Well, from here, we would uh, just say that A at the next time step is equal to A at the current time step plus uh, delta T times F of A. Uh, and so clearly what we want in order for this approximation to work is we would like to have the change in A uh, to be much smaller uh, than A itself. Otherwise, our approximation will not be accurate because A is changing a lot uh, and that will not satisfy the approximation uh, for the differencing uh, where both dt and dA are supposed to be small. So this is a condition for our uh, time step. So let's uh, now go back to our diffusion equation. Uh, so in the diffusion equation, we have d and dt uh, is equal to d d2n uh, dt squared. And so here uh, we will need uh, that uh, d uh, times delta t uh, times n divided by delta x squared is much smaller than n. So this is the equivalent of that statement for the diffusion equation. So it's d So it's d times dt, um, we moved it over here to the right, uh, times the approximation of this derivative and divided by uh, the size scale delta x. And so that is supposed to be much less than the value itself, much less than n in this case. And so this gives us the condition on the time step that delta t is much smaller than delta x squared over d, the diffusion coefficient. This is the equivalent of the current condition for the diffusion equation. This is how, after choosing delta x and uh, uh, knowing what the diffusion coefficient is, you can pick delta t such that your scheme will be stable. This prepares you to face any obstacles related uh, to the diffusion equation. Now we're going to wrap this uh, part up and in the next part I'm going to briefly go over the things that you might want to keep in mind when working on the a random walk questions in the last assignment of this course. How exciting is that? I'm going to see you in part 5 of lecture 11. Hello and welcome to the last part of our last lecture 11 of this really exciting, at least for me, the computational physics course, Physics 352. We are going to be wrapping this up uh, by talking a little bit about the uh, numerical intricacies of implementing a random walk as part of the last assignment 7. 
So how are you going to be actually going in and numerically implementing a random hopping of a particle around uh, your grid? Uh, or in a one dimensional or in two or multiple dimensions. So for that, you need a random number generator. And uh, for a specific example, to keep in mind, uh, let's say we need to implement a two dimensional random walk uh, as uh, the assignment asks you to. So for this, you need to have a random number generator. So you can either use uh, RAND uh, from the standard library, So you would uh, create a double variable x uh, that will take the output of the random number generator rand and divide it by the maximum uh, value that this, num that this random number generator can return, uh, which is uh, stored here in rand max uh, precompiler directive. And this will result in the value of x that varies uh, randomly between 0 and 1. So there is another way uh, that I propose you can use. Uh, if you work in this is all if you're working in C. Uh, the other one is you can use a random number generator uh, that I uploaded on Canvas and linked to from the most recent version of the problem set. So the way you would do that, you will make two calls to the random number generator. The first one, uh, and it's uh, called RAN1. Uh, the first one, you will pass it a variable actually a pointer to uh, that uh, variable, which I will call item, uh, and this item uh, if you set uh, to negative, uh, the first time you call it, the generator will be reset and use that number that you uh, set item to and passed a pointer uh, to. Uh, we'll use it as an initial random seed. And uh, then for subsequent use, uh, you uh, keep that same value. Keep feeding it back IDUM without changing it. Through the pointer, it will keep track of where in the random pseudo-random sequence that it returns you are, and will be spitting out numbers uh, between 0 and 1. If you're using Python, just look it up. What is the random number generator? And you can generate an entire sequence uh, of numbers. So um, if you want to get started and uh, you would like to work on something during the office hours or even before the office hours, well, why don't you go ahead and code up a one-dimensional random walk? I have to tell you that 
two-dimensional random walks when plotted look amazing, so there is definitely something exciting to look forward to. That does it for us tonight, or for this entire quarter. I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing you during the office hours, uh, looking forward to your uh, final project uh, presentations and write-ups, and uh, I have, I'm just so grateful uh, for the opportunity to uh, share this learning experience with you uh, for the past however many weeks it was. It feels like it has been a very long and exciting journey. I certainly hope that you share some of these feelings, that you've had fun. Perhaps it was difficult at times, uh, but I hope that the learning that you got as a result uh, is bringing you joy and happiness. I'm looking forward to catching up with you in the next couple of weeks and uh, hope to see you around campus. Again, a quick reminder, please do not forget to fill out the CTEX. This is how the university decides whether I'm doing a good job or not. Uh, and so I would definitely like to know if I am. Uh, the university would like to know if I am. And uh, if you have any comments, please, please, please put them in the CTAX. Uh, if they're good, if they're bad, if there is some suggestions for improvement um, or anything else, please put them all in there. And I'm really looking forward to reading them. Thank you so much again. I hope you have a blast with the computational physics and programming. Take it out to the world. Uh, unleash your, um, your dreams. Uh, and... Uh, I hope you have a, just a fantastic time uh, and please keep in touch. I would really love to know how you're doing and how you're using these tools and techniques uh, that you have uh, come across in this course and learned. And I hope to see you around. Bye.